Uh, now for something completely different. I'm going to tell you about Lambda Compose Lambda, a library for lattice cryptography. Uh, here, the, the name, uh, the capital Lambda refers to uh, lattices, which is usually done with the capital Lambda, and the combination of lattices with functional programming. Now, if you're nerdy enough, that name is pretty cute, but uh, uh, we need something a little easier for you all to remember. Uh, I know when you're texting about this after, our, our, after this talk, um, about this groundbreaking work. So we came up with this little acronym, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're my grandma's age, then something else. But OK, uh, lattice cryptography is also known as ring cryptography, so you might see it uh, called that. Um, and that's because efficient lattice schemes use cyclotomic rings, uh, which our work uses cyclotomic rings, and I'll talk more about those later. Uh, the lattice schemes themselves uh, drive their security from hard problems on lattices. And the lattice is uh, just a periodic infinite grid like this one in two dimensions here, except we use lattices in hundreds or thousands of dimensions. Uh, the main advantage of lattice cryptography is that the schemes are embarrassingly parallel, apparently secure against quantum attacks, and they enjoy security from worst case hardness assumptions. And what that means is if you take a random instance of one of these hard problems, it's as hard as any instance. Now I could say things like that for the next uh, nine minutes, but I'm going to spare you and instead we're going to use an analogy. So we're going to take a trip to the zoo. Uh, so, and we're going to look at lattice cryptography through the lens of cryptozoology, of course. So the, the cryptids at the zoo are lattice schemes like pseudorandom functions uh, and bully homework encryption. Um, so by their nature, cryptids are supposed to be mysterious, but the lattice cryptids have this special property that they can be composed of just a handful of mathematical objects and operations, including cyclotomic rings. I'm not really going to talk about the other ones, so we'll skip those for now. Um, and these are, these are the genes of lattice cryptography. And what LOL allows you to do is to genetically engineer the cryptids uh, by combining uh, these genes into any lattice scheme that you'd like. So it has uh, four main goals. First, we wanted composable interfaces that build on Haskell's algebraic and category theoretic hierarchies. So in particular, we use the numeric prelude uh, for the numeric type classes to reflect the algebraic structure in lattices. Uh, it's theory friendly. It supports specialized representations and fast algorithms for cyclotomic rings. Uh, and it has all the necessary tools to comport with the worst case hardness theorems. And this involves a lot of tricky math that's very difficult to get right, which is why we wrote a library. Um, next, it's, we use and abuse the type system to statically enforce mathematical constraints and internal invariants. Uh, and as evidence of this, we use 28 compiler extensions, GHC extensions, and uh, filed over 40 tickets uh, during this project. So, <laughs> uh, Finally, we wanted to be featureful to support enough genes so that we could create a wide variety of lattice schemes. Uh, to get the composable interfaces we wanted, we divided LOL into layers. So at the top is the cryptography layer, which contains where all the, the lattice schemes live. As we've seen, these schemes are composed of the genes, and in particular, uh, cyclotomic rings. So we have a cyclotomic layer. And if you remember from biology class, uh, genes are composed of DNA. So the next layer down is tensor, which has linear transformations on tensors. Uh, all of which have sparse decompositions, which we express with a domain-specific language. I'll talk more about that one in a little bit. And then DNA is composed of nucleotides, so we have, at the very base, uh, integer layer, like product rings and modular arithmetic, which we then lift to the tensor layer, um, like using functors and such. Uh, I'm going to talk a little more about the, the type-level factor of naturals next. But first, we have to go back to cyclotomic rings. So cyclotomic rings are defined by their cyclotomic index. Uh, so for every positive integer m, there's exactly one cyclotomic ring. The ring operations uh, are defined by the factorization of m. So for example, in my awesome picture, you can see that um, the m equals 6 ring is in some sense the product of the m equals 2 and m equals 3 ring. So you should expect that the operations also decompose with the factorization of m. Uh, some of the operations that we use involve more than one cyclotomic ring, and these operations typically have extra constraints, like requiring one index to divide another. And this is the kind of thing that we'd like to enforce at the type level. 
So to do that, we need to expose and manipulate the factorization at the type level, and then translate uh, between the data level and type level uh, representations of the factors. So to do that, we use data kinds and singletons to simulate dependent types. So in particular, we just define a prime power to be a prime exponent pair. Um, uh, factored natural is a list of these prime powers. With this representation, you can easily check if one divides another, or compute the, else, the least common multiple of, of two uh, naturals. Data kinds automatically promotes the prime power and factored values to types. And then if we singletonize these definitions, then we get type families corresponding to the functions, but on promoted types. Next up, so when we define cyclotomic rings, uh, we use tensors, which is an array of coefficients over a base ring. So our tensor class exposes several special linear transformations that correspond to ring operations. Uh, the class has a single parameter t, which is an unapplied tensor type, uh, parameterized by factored index m and a base ring r. And we have a constraint synonym t -elt, which allows us to restrict the kind of base rings that our tensor can hold, which allows us to use more efficient containers. For example, we can use unbox vectors uh, with an unbox constraint. Uh, next up are the transformations there. Um, notice that the POW and the DEC, these are different representations we can use. Uh, and there's different, different uses for each one, so we need multiple uh, transformations depending on the, the representation you use. Some of the transformations like embed uh, use multiple indices, so it goes from a tensor with index m to a tensor with index m prime, and we can easily express the divisibility constraint uh, using the previous slide. Now we want any tensor to implement all these functions for any valid M and R combination, which is why our class only has one parameter. But this has a drawback because now we can't express superclass constraints uh, that involve M and R. For example, we'd like to say that TM is applicative or that uh, TMR is EQ whenever R is EQ. And so instead we have to manually get these constraints using entailment. Uh, we currently have two tensor backends. One is uh, C++ using the foreign function interface, and another one uses REPA, and as of about three minutes ago, uh, me and Trevor McDonald got something working in Accelerate, hopefully, so. Okay, so as we just saw, the, the tensor methods are representation dependent, but this is really hard for users, uh, basically anyone who's not a PhD in lattice photography, uh, to figure out which one is the right one. So we have a, a sick data type that is a wrapper around the tensor layer that hides and manages the representation and chooses like a, a efficient, hopefully efficient uh, representation. So TMR here represents the mth cyclotomic ring over the base ring R back with tensor T. And you can see how we uh, use the tensor interface for EQ so we can get really decomposed constraints like EQR and then we can entail the EQ TMR using the tensor interface and do a good quality comparison. Uh, and you can also see embed has this nice constraint again, m divides m prime. It just matches on the sick constructor representing the representation and then calls the appropriate tensor function. And now I'm going to talk about something completely different again, uh, which is some of the challenges that we faced during development. So the first one I was going to talk about is that uh, compile time is very slow. We, some of our modules take uh, several minutes to compile, which is, uh, has a big impact on my productivity. Um, I was very happy to hear Simon talk about that this morning, and then Ben later on. I really appreciate your guys' effort in that area, and uh, I hope you guys will continue to work on that, and also implore any uh, implementers of new features to really keep that in mind. Uh, compile time matters. Okay, so that one's not really an issue anymore, and I, again, thank you. Um, I got to talk about this this morning, which I also appreciate the opportunity to do that, but we have problems with specialization, or lack thereof. Uh, we found that inlineable, inline, and specialized don't reliably induce specialization. Please look at ticket 8774. Uh, and something as simple as constraint synonyms can actually defeat specialization where it would otherwise occur. So special, or, uh, performance is really a black box uh, from our perspective, and we'd really like much more visibility into and control over specialization. Did you submit a bug report for that constraint synonym thing? Uh, it, I have not yet. It's going to be hard to, to isolate, but yeah, that's uh, that's on my list. Okay. 
But 8774 is a good start, guys. <laughs> All right, let's thank uh...